Um, when you start off with a considerable disadvantage that I did, I was the only Peruvian ever born in Watford. Um, I must explain why. My father came from Peru and my mother was extremely surprised because the Essex family that my mother came from had never actually met a Peruvian. And people still come up to me and say, what's Peruvia like? And uh, I think they are referring to Perugia, which as we all know is where those lovely bucky chocolates come from, from Italy. But um, Peru was where my ancestors finished up. Um, I'm actually the skian, or a long way down, from a Jewish gunsmith who uh, was languishing in um, a dungeon in uh, Sevilla when Pizarro turned up and said, uh, either you get cooked next week or you come to Peru with me. I need a gunsmith. And that is where the, the whole um, rather strange legend of Pizarro having chosen his 184 conquistadores from jailbirds comes from. Because nobody in his right mind who was out of prison would have gone with him. Because Pizarro uh, was offering them literally the same as a trip to the moon. Uh, my ancestor went with him along with a lot of other ancestors who were either Mudejar, they were either Moorish, or they were they were Judeo, they were Jewish. And they went with Pizarro and became Catholic because there wasn't much alternative at the time. <laughs> and married Incas. So not long ago, I was talking to my very dear friend, Sammy Davis Jr. And I said, standing next to you, Sammy, you look like a thoroughbred. <laughs> now, I was born in Watford, which is in Hertfordshire, but at the age of one, um, my father, who was a retired electrical engineer and an aeronautical engineer and a mechanical engineer and a damn good mathematician, um, developed asthma and especially said, Folkestone is marvelous for asthma. So we moved to Folkestone. The specialist was right. Folkestone was absolutely unique for asthma. <laughs> Practically everybody in Folkestone had it. So my father was unable to fulfill his, um, his commitments as an aeronautical, electrical, or mechanical engineer. And so he started to use his very adroit mind to investigate all sorts of different things. Now, he became interested in what is loosely called the paranormal, which to me is the normal. I mean, when I was a little boy, I used to go around to other little boys' houses and feel rather deprived because none of the furniture moved on its own. <laughs> and when I found that this was the norm, then I felt even more <laughs> deprived. But there it was. Daddy came into this rather strange area of, uh, of research in 1930, I think it was. I was, I was a boy of eight. Uh, and um, my mother said, a friend of mine, Miss Purse, is going to a spiritualist meeting at a bungalow near Hawkins, which was the airfield perched high above Folkestone. And father, a very shy man, and, and he said, well, yes, if she needs a lift, I'd be delighted, but I can't stay. Mother said, you will stay and pick her up, and then you will bring her back. So father said, yes, because he was a good husband. And he went there, and the sitting was in a bungalow uh, beside Hawkins Airfield. Now, what had happened was that the, the lady who owned the bungalow was the widow of an RAF pilot who had been killed on the airfield some years before. And she became interested in spiritualism. I, I hasten to add I'm not a spiritualist. I don't knock it, but I'm just an ordinary researcher, and so I'm a, uh, a compulsive non-joiner. I don't join anything un 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 until, I've, uh, until I've stopped researching. So you'll have to excuse me if you thought I was a spiritualist. I don't knock it at all, because there are many beliefs that I hold in common. Anyway. Father turned up and he was the only man there in a small sitting room in which there were about 15 or 20 people. So father was in a corner, a very shy man, and the medium came from Tenterton or Canterbury, I can't remember which. Uh, she was a middle-aged lady and she gave one or two messages to various members which, as is usual with this type of message, sounded very banal and father thought, well, very interesting, but not very convincing. And suddenly she swung over and said, I'd like to come to you, sir. And the uh, at the end of the room, and all the ladies turned around. Because he was the only man present, 
And she said, um, do you know the name Bolton? So I said, no, I, I'm awfully sorry, not really, no. Thinking, you know, I wish I was somewhere else. And she said, there, um, there's a young lady here uh, called Bolton, I think. He said, no, I, I've never actually met a young lady called Bolton. He said, wait a minute, no, 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 the young lady's saying, she is not called Bolton, the town that you met in is called Bolton, and she wants to thank you for what you did for her. So all the ladies turned around <laughs> in Bolton. And father had shrunk right down in the chair, and he said, well, I honestly don't remember even going to Bolton, let alone um, doing anything for a young lady that you should be grateful for. So she said, wait a minute. The young lady said, ah, she said, are you a theatrical, sir? And my father said, no, I'm an aeronautical engineer. I'm an engineer. I said, oh, she's showing me a theater, a stage. How very strange. Oh, wait a minute. She said, this will convince you. There isn't a play or a show going on on that stage in Bolton, but you are a very young person when you met her, and there's an auction going on on the stage. And my father said, oh, my God, I do remember. And he came back uh, that evening, and the next morning he got us together, my elder brother and myself, my brother's six years older than I am, I was about eight, and he was about 14, and he said um, to my mother, now Florence, um, when I was a very young man, I was only about 18, I was at the London School of Electromagnetism at Faraday House, remember it said, and um, he said, another South American student and myself, who was also an electrical engineer, uh, fell in love with a young actress. And she went on tour during the summer vac, and we played about four or five dates. We were just working as sort of walk-ons and helping with the scenery, and uh, the whole thing folded in Bolton. And the manager ran off with the money. Well, in those days, no equity or anything like that, <coughs> so the whole cast was stranded. And Father had the bright idea of going to the local newspaper and saying, would you put in an advert for Nout, because we are stranded, um, saying there will be an auction on the stage, this little theater in Bolton, of all the properties to do with this show, the scenery and the costumes, the skips, everything, props and what have you. And uh, that night, uh, my father and his friend cabled their guardian, Mrs. Southery, in London, and asked for five golden sovereigns each, to be collected the next day at the post office in Bolton, which they did. You tried doing it today. And they then went to the stage manager and they said, look, uh, we're going back to London because we're a bit shy. Uh, here is an envelope with five golden sovereigns for this young lady to get her back to London and keep her going for a week or two. Uh, we're going now. Here's a half crown, which was a lot of money in those days. Uh, will you buy back? all her personal props and put them in her personal skip and see that it gets loaded on the train. And they went down and, and got on the train and never heard hide nor hair of the young lady afterwards. Until this rather strange message that my father got. Now had it been any other sort of message or something that he was thinking of, then it wouldn't have intrigued him so much, but it sparked off this train of thought and he started to research the paranormal. Well, um, we, we met all the phonies and the charlatans and the, uh, and the self-deluded, but blessedly, because my brother and I were included as my father's guinea pigs, we also met the genuine. And I will always be eternally grateful to my mother and father for allowing me in on the ground floor of what was to be the most exciting part of my entire life. Not the least because I didn't speak until I was 16. I, I suffered from the most appalling stammer, one of those <coughs> type stammers. And I was finally cured by a speech trainer and two psychic healers who finally got me a voice, which was pretty exciting, and I've never bloody stopped talking since. But <laughs> Now, my father had had a very interesting experience when he was a young man. I wrote about it in a book. It always struck me as an interesting one. When he was um, a youngster of about 20, he, they used to have in those days, we're talking about the turn of the century, <coughs> they used to have weekend house parties. 
uh, and his whole guardian's household with about 40 young students from all over the world used to go down to Hailing Island and take over a big house in Hailing Island for about a month. It was an old house, it had been built in the 18th century. And one, uh, one evening in the summer, a very beautiful night, full moon and everything, uh, there were about 40 or 50 of these youngsters there having a high old time. There were any drinking punch, that type of thing. When one of the girls screamed because in the moonlight she'd seen this very frightening face, very white face, looking in through the window. So all the, the bright young men who, who couldn't wait to show off their macho manhood leapt into the garden to find out who the intruder was. Now, as I say, it was very bright moonlight. My father was one of these bright young men. And they searched the garden, and eventually this very thin, father described him as exceptionally thin uh, figure, burst out of the bushes and made across the tennis court pursued and hallooed by these very athletic young men who were really showing off to the, the pretty girls. When he got to the center of the, the tennis court, they surrounded him and started to move in on him with, as my father said, considerable reluctance because of his almost skeletal thinness and the extraordinarily white, cavernous face that he had, this very uh, emaciated face with these glowing eyes None of them really wanted to touch him at all. And just as they were about to finally make the final dive, he vanished. And uh, so in a rather subdued mood, they all went back to uh, join the rest of the house party, which then uh, they said, oh, well, that was an intruder to the girls, etc., etc." But it was a very subdued house party. My father had never really forgotten that. So he had already had a rather interesting experience. To go back to Folkestone, Folkestone had a small spiritualist church, which was uh, on the uh, Savoy Hill, I think they called it. Uh, and so most of our test cases came from the mediums who were booked for the little church there. And Father, in order to repay the church for its kindness in providing so many test cases, made for them in his garage, he was a very fine craftsman, the very large altar rail, which I understand is still there now that the church has moved to the bail, and I believe that's still there. So I, I wonder how many mediums have actually lent on this very splendid oak altar rail that my father built there. Uh, mother was marvelous. She was a very practical lady, an Essex girl from the Dawkins family, and uh, although father was completely detached when he was engaged in, in research, he could be a very emotional man when he wasn't researching. Mother had that marvelous Essex sense of humor. And she didn't like the charlatans at all, obviously. She was very kind with the self-deluded. But I remember one charlatan that we had who looked at Mother, who was then, I suppose, in her late 30s, and said, Whoa! Whoa! We're talking about 1931 by now. Looking at her, thinking she must have lost somebody in the First World War, you see. And Mother said, she used to get, her eyes used to go rather small, like peppermint balls. And her mouth looked like a chicken about to lay an egg when she was angry. And I saw this rather strange facial change on her, and I thought, oh, he's in for a bad time. <laughs> and so she said, is that you, Obadiah? <laughs> and I thought, Obadiah? And he said, yes, yes, Flo. Now, my mother's name is Florence, and she loathed the name Flo. She'd answered to Floss, but only to close members of the family, but Flo, no. And her face became even more rigid. <laughs> and she said, yes, it's a miracle to talk to you, Obadiah. I said, yes, it is. She said, especially as you're a dog. <laughs> However, <laughs> to continue with the, the phonies, because we had an awful lot of them too, before we got to the genuine gold, uh, we got what I would call the regulars at seances. For example, the regulars were uh, Napoleon Bonaparte here, and on one glorious occasion, Napoleon E.C., <laughs> which was the full extent of Bonaparte's French. <laughs> and um, Count von Bismarck, who had spoke no German, <laughs> and on one wonderful occasion, uh, Victoria, Queen Victoria here, 
and to my absolute delight, followed by Victoria Vagina. <laughs> the, um, we also, for some unknown reason, <coughs> except that a very nice lady had passed over in a very severe accident uh, involving a car, we would occasionally get Isadora Duncan. I remember one medium went, Isadora Duncan, yeah. without a trace of an American accent. And um, little lady said, oh, the Isadora Duncan. And the lady on the end, who was very honest, said, who's oh, Isadora Duncan? She said, you remember that exotic American dancer who had a very peculiar death. She was driving an open car, wearing a long scarf, and it wrapped round a back wheel and broke a neck. She said, have you a message for us, Miss Duncan? And my mother said, 80 to 1, she's going to say, don't drive an open car while working a long scarf. <laughs> so we had that strata to work through. But at the same time, father had built a lab, which was very, very efficient. He'd spent an enormous amount of time building various types of physical apparatus, like very sensitive spring balances, a morph key which would go off if you, if you just touched it, and a marvelous electrical apparatus which spelt out all the letters of the alphabet plus good night, God bless you, and everything else, which also uh, you only had to breathe on the thing started working. And we sat round a table for three months with these very fine pieces of apparatus, none of which moved at all, and at the end of it, the table went straight up in the air. <laughs> and I remember my father saying, I think they're trying to tell us something. <clears throat> now, we had a lot of the early researches using the old table tapping technique, and people say, oh, you didn't go into the old table tapping. Yes. And I'm fully aware of the experiments that were done in Toronto, I think it was, in which uh, some young scientists got together and they invented an archetype. They, they invoked an archetype which they called Philip and they, they put together all these ideas of what Philip would be like. And of course what they did in the end was they created the archetype of Philip in the same way that one uh, Arthur Conan Doyle um, created the archetype of, of uh, Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes. If I say Sherlock Holmes to you, you all more or less see the same thing. The man with the fore and aft on the and the, uh, the big magnifying glass and pipe, and the Norfolk jacket or the Inverness cape with his friend Dr. Watson. If I say um, Robin Hood to you, you see a brawny archer with a beard, uh, looking either like Errol Flynn or whoever played him the last time on the films, or Richard, Richard Green. <coughs> and uh, you have in your mind such a clear picture that it's interesting when you consider that neither of them ever existed. The same with Philip you can create a synthetic entity. And by summoning the totality of your energy, which the Chinese would call qi, you can then move furniture, etc. In the case of the six years that I worked in table sciences with my parents, I was fascinated because the table took on a different personality as each entity came through. It sounds insane, doesn't it? Because we only rested our fingers on it, the table moved under our fingers. And from the moment the phenomena started, there would be a current of exceptionally cold air which would start at our ankles and start circling underneath the table, rise to the level of our waist, and then the table would start to move. Also, we got very, very strong generation of electrostatic energy. Now, the scientists will instantly say, how did you measure it? We didn't, we just knew it was there because mother and I had very similar dry curly hair and as soon as the electrostatic was generated, it went straight up in the air like Albert Einstein. So we knew that there, for the, the physical phenomena to take place, it required static in considerable amounts and also a drop in temperature. The no question of a drop in temperature instantly saying this phenomena will be evil or manifested in a negative fashion. It just happens to be the conditions under which this type of thing seems to work. We're talking about physical phenomena. Um, another interesting factor about the table sittings was that when the table was tapping out its form of morse, it was rather like when I was working in British intelligence during the war, which proves how desperate the British were during the war, um, our operators using the S-phones each had what we called a fist. 
And that was, you could instantly tell who was operating it by the beep, 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 beep. There was a cadence, and everybody had a different fist. And one of the security checks that you weren't in enemy hands or being coerced in some way was you had built in a security check. And in the case of Operation North Pole in Holland, sadly, the um, the control operator <coughs> at London Signals HQ didn't pick up the fact that this particular agent had been captured. And so everybody that was dropped subsequently went into the hands of the Gestapo, and most of them died in the concentration camps. But the way the table operated was as distinctive as a Morse operator's fist. There's no argument about that, which was interesting. We met people like Estelle Roberts, Helen Hughes, Joe Benjamin, Mrs. Osmond Leonard, Arthur Baduri, Bernard Roden, Enid Barmer, who was a transfiguration medium, quite the most exceptional medium I think I've ever seen, and Jack Weber, who was a physical medium, an ex-coal miner that lived in Tenterton. Enid Barmer's worth, worth a mention. She was a small, rather pale lady. She charged six guineas for the weekend, three guineas for the specialist church, and three guineas for us, which wasn't exactly a fortune. <clears throat> Sat on a summer's, late summer's, afternoon in a big chair in our drawing room and in full light we had to draw one part of the curtain so that it wasn't blinding in full light of a late summer afternoon her face changed into just about everything you can think of a judge in full court wig um, a young girl with red hair all of whom were recognized that was extraordinary there were about 20 of my father's colleagues all scientists and their wives and uh, there were three cameras operating. My father had a, um, a Kodak, one of those flip-flop things that the press used, the old 912. And uh, uh, Michael Thomas and David Thomas, the actor's brother, who lived just up the road from us, <coughs> was using an Iconta, I think. And uh, uh, Dr. Jim Jameson, who was one of our researchers, was using one of the latest Kodaks, or whatever it was. And between them, they took 12 photographs of my father's signal. When they were developed, each by different developer. One was Hawksworth Wheeler did some. Uh, Mike did his own development, and Dr. Jameson, I think, went somewhere else. I don't think Boots was operating there. And these 12 pictures came out, some on plate and some on roll film. And on the first one, there is Mrs. Barmer sitting in the chair. And on the last one, there is Mrs. Barmer sitting in the chair. The rest are all fogged. All the plates were fogged all the films fogged as though by intense radiation. In fact, Dr. Rusak, uh, who was a very well-known radiologist in the town, a great friend of father's and a co-researcher, said that with radiation of that intensity, we should all go and consult a physician, which was interesting. So that was the type of experience one was having. The most remarkable medium I ever met was a grocer in Dover. He was a little man called Eddie Partridge. And he was a wonderful man. He had one of those corner shops where they sell everything from a needle to an anchor. And it smelt of sugar mice and cheese under, under one of those uh, porcelain covers and ham under glass and broken biscuits and all sorts of intriguing things. Very small shop. And it had big weights at the side. And it, it was a lovely shop, very small. And they lived above it and at the back of it. And Eddie bred the most famous racing pigeons in the world. They are the breed called Champion Eddie, and he was a dear man. He really was the loveliest person. And he's the wife, Barney, they're both very small. And he was the finest telekinetic I ever met. Um, he managed to levitate my mother, who was a good 14 stone, she was a big lady. And uh, she was levitated in red light, right across the table, and deposited in the lap of a sitter the other side. Now, there were four of them. My father was a small man. Eddie was small, Barney was small, and his brother-in-law, Charlie Walker, who was a lifeboatman, was wiry but small. So how they picked up Mother in that sort of uh, deep red light, in which we were taking infrared pictures, uh, was quite miraculous. He also, I remember one marvelous incident when there was a biscuit salesman came in, you know, all beer and bonhomie, and he came in and um, said, right, Mr. Partridge, <laughs> Amesha McVitie and Price, what orders? And Eddie said, well, he got about as far as that, and a 10-pound weight went straight up in the air, crossed the counter, and banged down the other side. <laughs> and all the, the paper bags which were on strings went... <laughs> 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 and 
and the biscuit salesman said, what the <laughs> was that? And Eddie, who was very shy, said, probably the draft. <laughs> My father was most intrigued with Eddie's healing ability. He was one of those extraordinarily spiritual people who were very practical, down to earth like a little sparrow. And during the Depression, which was in full blast in those days, he kept the whole of that district alive and well. And I don't think he ever dunned anybody for sixpence. Somehow, he was always able to provide for them, and somehow they got through. And his son became the manager of Booth's. And Eddie was illiterate. He could neither read nor write, but he used to do the stock taking. And then, then he would do all by automatic writing. I wish to God I could. <laughs> and he'd, he'd be talking to you and putting it all down. And then his son would add it up, and within a farthing it was right. That's extraordinary. There was also a little medium in Sandgate who was a homely little body, and she wrote German with this hand, academic German, which father spoke very well and could read very well, uh, with abstruse math in, some of the symbols of which didn't appear for some ten years, and academic French with his hand. Well, she said things like, oh, no, Felton Fleet, of course, you lads, we see a lot of people from Felton Fleet, and talked about Folkestone and gossip and everything. And I watched in amazement. She had a whole pot of pencils, all sharpened, and as one wore out, she'd pick up another and go on writing it. And father would go through it with his uh, colleagues. The most extraordinary documents. And one was all about abstruse, mathematics with, with German uh, comments on it and the other was all a French academia of some sort. But an extraordinary woman and she also knew Eddie of course. The most extraordinary experiences I had with Eddie, there was a girl, <coughs> I didn't have this experience but my father told me about it directly afterwards. He came in from Dover and his face was glowing and he said, what I've just seen may have been done by a grocer in Dover, and I mean no disrespect by this, neither did his father, he said. I think the last time it was done was probably by a carpenter in Nazareth. But what had happened was that the shop bell, which was one of those things on a spring that went tinkle 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 tinkle, <coughs> the door opened, burst open really, and into Eddie's shop came a very pretty young girl of about 13 crying hysterically. Now, she would have been exquisite, but her face was covered in the most god-awful acne. Acne rosea, I think they call it. And father thought, oh, dreadful shame. And she rushed over to Eddie, because everybody adored Eddie, and she flung herself into his arms and said, Uncle Eddie, everybody called him Uncle Eddie. I'm going to chuck myself over the cliff, which of course was Dover, it was very probable she was too. And Eddie said, no, 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 you won't. Eddie. You'll be all right, you'll be all right. And comforted her. And then father said the most amazing thing I've ever seen. He says he passed his hand over this child's face, uh, keeping the fingers about two or three inches from it, and said, you'll be all right, love. You go back and have a nice cup of tea and lie down, and you come see me when you feel a bit better. And this child went off. She stopped crying. She went back home, and they were still talking because they did an awful lot of research together. She, she came back. She danced into the shop. She said, there's no question of of verse, she danced in, and father said she, her face was radiant, absolutely radiant, and she twirled round as young girls will, and she said, look at me, Uncle Eddie, not a mark. Now, I've talked to a number of researchers and, and scientists about this, and doctors, and one said, yes, well, <laughs> pretty obvious what he was all about, um, twins. <laughs> Interesting theory. One with acne and the other without. <laughs> Identical twins, of course. Uh, unfortunately, she was an only child, so that theory went up the wall. Next one was more interesting. Uh, this time, it was a very in interesting man who was a great friend of mine since passed over. He was a, a physician, a very good one. He was Catholic, and he said, it is possible, Michael. He said, uh, Catholics very often come up with the experience of... Um, hysterical stigmata. He said, you get, this, uh, you, you get contemplative orders uh, of monks and nuns, Father Peer being the, one of the most famous, who will manifest the wounds of Christ in, in ecstasy. And uh, this is referred to in medicine as hysterical stigmata. 
I said, what about hysterical acne? She said, no, I've never heard of that. I said, no, well, I, I, I've had acne as a young boy, and there's no question about it. Uh, it is an appalling thing for a youngster to have, and at the same time, I don't think there's any way, no matter how rapidly it was healed, in which it wouldn't leave a mark. Now, I've talked to a lot of physicians about this, and they all came up with the same answer. Yes, we agree that's so. So what had been witnessed, and I, I don't want to offend anybody's religious sensitivity here, was a miracle of some sort. I can't possibly explain it, neither could my father. Uh, the experience I had with Eddie, which I've never forgotten, was just before the war, the outbreak of war in 39. Like a lot of 17-year-olds, I was a bit apprehensive. There was that feeling of tension in the air. We all knew it was uh, coming because of the Spanish Civil War had been the rehearsal for it. And Father Twig that I was feeling rather, rather nervous about it, and so he took me to see Eddie, and Eddie picked it up immediately, and he said, I'll tell you what, but I'll shut the shop. I want you to come along, and we'll, we'll go into the country, the Weald of Kent. It was a lovely late summer night, and again moonlight, intermittent cloud, about six-tenths cloud, and sure enough, we went into the wheels in father's car, stopped about 10 miles outside Dover, <coughs> went into a dell, and in the dell was a wood, quite a big wood. And in the center of the wood, which was full of bracken, it was very much like this particular summer, it had been a good summer, 39, produced a lot of bracken. And oddly enough, as we walked through in the moonlight, Eddie in the front, uh, myself in the middle, my father on the end, we didn't seem to be making much noise going through the drying bracken, which was odd. There were no twigs cracking underneath or anything. Total feeling of peace. We got to the center of the wood. It was a clearing, four or five times the size of this room, this hall. And uh, Eddie stood in the center of it. I can see him now. He, was, he, he turned round, and the moon came out from behind a cloud, and it was shining on him. And his face was smiling and full of light. And he went. And then he made a sound. I can only describe it as a very quiet sound, halfway between a whistle and a word. And every bird, beast, rabbit, weasel, stoat, rat, anything, mouse, whatever, that jumped or crawled or hopped or flew or cawed or chirruped or whatever, answered him in one tremendous shout of welcome. It was as though Pan himself had entered the wood. And then he turned to me and he said, you see, and I didn't be frightened of Michael. And I was crying and I turned around and my father was crying. I've never forgotten it. It was a moment of pure magic. To get to a war experiences in which the paranormal played a part, or as I think of it, the normal, I actually had a near-death experience about 500 yards from here. Um, I was an RAF cadet, uh, aircrew cadet. I'd only finally managed to get in after 14 months trying when I was arrested as a deserter. <laughs> which was interesting as I hadn't been in yet. <laughs> and my name was outside the theater in which I was finally reduced to playing in the theater until I became an actor. <coughs> when this sergeant came in and said, Mr. Michael Vintine, I said yes. He said, you're 65 days adrift. Take your sword through it. You might do yourself a mischief. We were playing in Shakespeare at the time, and I was in a doublet and a hose. And Robert Atkins, who was my producer, said, you're mad. He's trying to get into the RAF, not trying to get out of it. <laughs> well, I got my order, sir. You take this young man. Did it. And they took me away in my doublet and a hose. <laughs> this is all true. I claim to be the first British serviceman to appear in a doublet and hose on a defaulter's parade for 300 years. <laughs> and I was behind the cell bars and I was feeling a bit miffed and I suddenly said, John Abler, una palabra de inglés, solamente castellano. He spoke to me, what did you say? <laughs> I said, I don't speak English, I only speak Castilian Spanish, which is a dead lie, really. He said, you're bluffing. I said, no, no, I'm a Peruvian subject as well as being British subject. 
I said, if you've got some papers there, presumably you have, by some miracle, my last application, the 14th, was accepted. Only nobody bothered to tell me. So he, went, he looked at it and he said, oh, God, Fred, he really is a bloody wog. <laughs> so when I finally got into the RAF, I was extremely enthusiastic about coming here for my aircrew training. And right in the middle of it, when things were going terribly well, uh, we were lined up because we were going to be sent. We'd been off to ITW, and then we came back again, off to EFTS and came back again, and we were going to be shipped to Canada. We knew that because we were issued with tropical kit. <laughs> if you went to Rhodesia or South Africa, they issued you with Arctic kit <laughs> to fool the Hun. <laughs> and we were the last, last three aircrew cadets on the end of the flight. And I saw this medical orderly change the bottles of serum. This was ATT, the booster injection. We already had the others some months before. This was the booster for going overseas. Anti-tetanus, anti-typhoid, anti-paratyphoid, anti-typhus. And we, as I say, were the last three. And we were banged in this arm, banged in that arm. Six hours later, one of us was dead, one of us was paralyzed, and I was dying. The near-death experience was interesting. We had been given the cultures of each of those diseases. The batch, of course, can happen in wartime, had obviously not been properly treated. Not that we were thinking about this, because we were in agony. I mean, the boy that died really did die in agony, and I, was in, I, I haven't had pain like that ever before. Uh, because tetanus, is, lockjaw is, is a frightening thing. The others were terrified. And, uh, you know, like most, by this time I was, what, 18 and a half, coming up 19, pretty frightened by that time. And uh, I remember being taken into the central sick quarters at Abbey Lodge, and I don't remember very much else except the pain, and they gave me a lumbar puncture without anesthetic, because that's the way they did it in those days, because they thought I had meningitis. And then I felt myself leave my body, and all the pain stopped. And I found myself, as it were, in space, with a great darkness below me, but not frightened. Awestruck, yes, <laughs> the, the word that they use so much nowadays, awesome, marvelous description. And at the same time, I had this wonderful feeling of peace, no pain, no fear, and surrounded by light, except below me, this abyss of darkness, but nothing frightening about it. And I mean, I get sick on, uh, on the second story of the Eiffel Tower, so it, uh, it, it couldn't have been a physical reaction to it. However, I suddenly found myself, as it were, waiting for somebody. And then the waiting stopped. I don't know how long it went on, because time is relative. And I was pulled back, and I felt myself pulled back, and I woke up in the, the bed at Central Sick Quarters, barely able to speak, and this beautiful face looking at me. And I thought, my God, an angel. It's an angel. It must be an angel. And this voice said, oh, you have been a long way. And it was the sister. It's a very pretty girl. And I then heard this sort of argument going on. And I'm trying to think, oh, it's one of ours. No, 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 definitely not one of ours. And I, I, I realized very vaguely, because I couldn't see very well, they came right into vision. I went, oh, you see, they obviously knew that I was back. C came in a very high-ranking padres, because this was a group headquarters here uh, of uh, Air Training Command. And uh, they must have been very near to God, because they had a lot of rings on, you see. <laughs> and the first one, who I presume was the Catholic padre, said, feeling better, my son. And the other one said, it was obviously the Protestant, said, uh, Feeling better, lady? <laughs> and I said, I'm alive. Piss off. <clears throat> and I'm quite honest about it because y you don't, you know, when you've been through an experience like that, I was amazed I could speak at all. Then I lapsed into unconsciousness, and there was a terrific fight for about six months. At the end of it, um, they put me in British. British intelligence, because I was a volunteer. I spoke French and Spanish, so they put me with the Poles. <laughs> um, 
The Poles weren't the luckiest, but they had wonderful eyesight. They could not only read the bottom line of the eye chart, they could also pronounce it. And they had <laughs> great skill. Dear, wonderful people, and I shall be meeting one on film next week. We're going up to Hemswell to chat each other up and things. Um, when I was with 626 and 12 Squadron at Wickenby, uh, it, during that appalling winter uh, of 43-44, when we lost something like, I suppose, between 18 and 20,000 personnel in those appalling raids over Germany, um, I, I found myself reacting in a very peculiar way. I used to brief a lot of the raids. I used to fly with any, any air crew that were kind enough to allow me to fly with them. There's a lot of these aircraft uh, were, of course, single controls, and they'd have to release the controls, you'd jump in. Because I could fly an airplane, remember. And um, I had the extraordinary experience of being so close to air crew, especially when you brief them and have flown with them, of walking into the mess after briefing a raid on, say, Peenemunde or, or Duisburg. They're all named after fish. Berlin was white bait, I remember. Typically British there. And um, I would see which ones would die that night because their faces turned into a skull. And it was the most appalling feeling. Now, being, being in intelligence, one was able to follow the course of a missing crew very often, unless they were never found, because the ones that were killed in action would come back as a form, you know, through, uh, through uh, Switzerland, through the Swedish Red Cross, the International Red Cross. So I knew damn well how horribly accurate this particularly loathsome curse, is the description that I gave to it, had become. I'd become too involved with the whole operation. And I went to the local padre. I didn't go to the MO because he'd have put me in the nut house. I went to the padre, who was a First World War Grenadier Guards officer who had left the war, First World War, and taken holy orders. And he said, you wouldn't be the first person to come to me with this particular condition. And I said, how do we get rid of it? He said, we kneel down and we pray, which we did. And thereby, whichever way you like to look at it, you could even say that we psychologically blocked my unconscious mind. And it never troubled me again until 1971 when I was falling about laughing with my, my elder son, Gus, <coughs> and his mother. We were falling about laughing about nothing in particular, as we always did, in the old nursery at, um, at Isha. And all of a sudden, my son's face uh, turned into the skull. And uh, I stopped laughing rather abruptly, and Gus said, what's wrong? And I said, come in the other room. And I had seen a small light airplane uh, flying along above a horizon that I couldn't determine. <coughs> pull up, stall, go in, no fire. And I said, if you fly with this young pilot, Andy, they were great mates, they used to go scuba diving every weekend, you both die. And he said, what a terrible thing to say. He's a jolly good pilot. I said, he can be reached often. It's a question of the meeting of two world lines. If you do that, you die. You have to tell him. And of course, being a young man, he said, what about the scuba diving? I said, nothing to do with scuba diving. You can do that as much as you like. And I liked Andy, and I knew he was a good pilot. And of course, 12 weeks later, that's what happened. And it was nine and a half weeks before they found him. However, my son manifested to me in the garden within hours of his death, even though um, his mother was hopeful that he was just missing. And he touched me, I, f I felt him touch me. And he said, I'm dreadfully sorry, Daddy. It, was, it just bent the car. And he said, um, it wasn't Andy's fault the bloody machine went wrong in the air. Not the most spiritual message ever received from son to father, but very evidential because Captain Hunt, who was a good friend of mine, of the air accident branch, 11 months proving that in fact the aircraft had gone wrong in the air. There had been no mandatory pressure test on the manifold, uh, meaning that the primary heat exchanger contained very large quantities of carbon and lime which any engineer in the audience would know instantly would indicate heavy uh, generation of carbon monoxide, which of course was the thing that disorientated the pilot and caused them to crash. Um, people think in some way that I only became interested in possibility of survival or continuity as I prefer to think of it, because to me life is a constant stream, uh, as is all evolution. Uh, 
because my son was killed or because of my experiences in the, in the Second World War? And of course, the answer is not at all. I only became interested in it because I was trained in it ever since I was a tiny boy. Um, people say, have you ever seen a ghost? And I say, yes, I've seen quite a number of so-called ghosts. Uh, quite often people have seen ghosts who are so solid they don't even know they're ghosts. I saw a ghost of a man I didn't even know was dead. And that was in the RAF, a friend of mine, Pop Walker. He was 34, so we called him Pop. Um, he was a navigator, very large, bulky man, lovely man. He was a Northumberland, I think, or Cumberland. And he lived in Yorkshire. And I was going on leave, 48 hours leave. And he said, see you when you get back, Mike. And I said, oh, great, yes, sure, Pop. And I came back at 23.59 hours. This was in Lincolnshire at Wickenby. Moonlit night again. It seems to be odd that that moonlight seems to play such a part in it. Probably because they're usually on a cold, dry night. Walking through the snow to my dispersed hut and coming towards me in the moonlight, absolutely solid, was Pop Walker. Why should I think he was anything else but Pop Walker? I didn't know he'd been killed 24 hours before. Uh, I waved at him, said, had a great leave, and he went straight into his hut. And I thought, oh, well, he wants to be with himself. And I went into my hut, which I shared with six other officers, <coughs> and um, slipped into bed. And in the morning, 6 a.m., we were operating again the next day. And the batman, Albert, came in. He was cockney, he said, uh, he actually brought in the shaving water and the coffee. Uh, you couldn't really tell which was which. <laughs> and he said, uh, shocking thing about Mr. Walker, so nice to see you back. You weren't here when it happened, I said. What was not here when what happened? He said, Mr. Walker, sir. He was killed with a sprog crew. They went into the walls, blew up. I said, that'd be bloody silly. I saw him last night. Oh, no, 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 last night, so he'd be dead 24 hours. Well, that was a fairly evidential um, experience. People have asked me if, having been in intelligence, I ever came across the fact that the Nazis used paranormal methods during their waging of the war, and of course the answer was yes, I did. I talked to a large number of people who knew roughly what was going on. <clears throat> One of them was my friend Ewan Montague, who wrote that brilliant book, The Man Who Never Was, a great tall, hawk-like man, wonderful man. Very old Jewish family, very, very old family. His brother was known as Red Ivar. He was very radical, and Ewan was very much straight down the middle, very liberal, very nice man. And he was assistant to the DNI, Admiral Godfrey. And Admiral Godfrey said within a few weeks of him turning up and joining him, he said, um, I wonder if um, you could go out and get me three astrologers. So Ewan said, don't you mean three astronomers, sir? He said, no, if I want three astronomers, I'll ask for them. I want three astrologers. He said, surely you don't believe in that nonsense. He said, no, I don't, but Adolf Hitler does. And the, the difficulty though they got the three leading astronomers, including Naylor in, uh, in England, the difficulty was to find three astrologers that agreed on the ephemeris that they were casting. So this sort of thing went on. There is, of course, the, the extraordinary case of, I believe the name is Mr. Mrs. Grundry. I only ran across it once, <coughs> in, in which I, I was doing some PRU, Photographic Reconnaissance Unit briefing, and uh, there was a pair of dousers. They were in their late 70s, one of them was 80, I think their name was Mr. and Mrs. Grundry, but I'm not sure. And they used to be let in by Admiral Godfrey into the chart room at the Admiralty, which was slightly harder to get into than the Kingdom of Heaven. <laughs> and there they would douse charts of the enemy coast. Oh, how interesting. We've got uh, two destroyers. Oh, yes. Spare breaker. We haven't had a spare breaker before. Either. And these two old dears, bless them, were about 90% right because we didn't send out PRU. I didn't know, actually, at the time. That was the source of the information. Or I might have been slightly more reticent in sending out my aircraft. But <laughs> because they were unarmed, except for their cameras, and they'd come back with the results. And eventually I said, what is the source of the information? And they told me, and I let it drop dead. <laughs> People say to me, of what earthly use is the paranormal in everyday life? Well, obviously, women use it the whole time. They call it women's intuition. And I think the reason that they're better at it than we are is that they are nearer to the natural cycle than we are. We've gone a long way 
past our natural type of environment, whereas women still have this, this attachment to the circadian cycle. That may be an explanation. I know that if my wife says, instinctively, I feel that's wrong, I'd accept it. If she says, I've been thinking about it for three days and it's wrong, I'd argue. <laughs> what is so infuriating is she's usually right both times. <laughs> Quite recently, shortly before Mary Rogers, the medium, died, I had an extraordinary experience with her. There were about 17 of us, and we were holding um, experimental sittings at St. George's Hill, and all of a sudden, Mary uh, went into a trance, and she said, Donald Campbell here, Michael. Now, I'd only met Donald Campbell once in my life, but anybody who knew Donald would know that he's an extraordinary person, and he impressed himself on your mind for the whole of the rest of your life. And so I said, well, all right, if you are Donald, Donald Campbell, then you can answer this quite simply. Um, where did we meet? When did we meet? Why did we meet? Where did you take me? And what did you take me to see? And he laughed, and it was Donald's laugh, no question. He said, that's easy, that's easy. He said, we met at the BBC, I'd come to collect Tonya, that was his wife, I took you to Dolphin Square, where his flat was, and he said, I showed you my father's hunting rifles. Now, there were only two people in that room who could possibly know that. I was one of them, and presumably the shade of Donald Campbell was the other. That sort of evidence is so unexpected, it's awfully difficult to logicalize. I suppose somebody could say, well, perhaps Mary Rogers had known Donald, Donald Campbell. I'm sure she had but it's extraordinarily unlikely that Donald Campbell would have told her about that very slight occurrence. It was slight in the same way that my father's first piece of evidence about the lady from Bolton was slight. But it, it was interesting to me. People have said to me, is there such a thing as a psychic attack in terms of Diane Fortune's brilliant book, um, psychic Self-Defense. I love that title, Psychic Self-Defense. And I say, yes, I've come across a lot of it. I've suffered from some of it in terms of the media. I disagreed with Sir Hugh Carlton, Carlton Green over certain principles that he was employing <coughs> in the BBC. And from then on, I did suffer quite a heavy type of psychological attack, uh, which uh, halted my my career in the middle of um, Square World, which you remember with such delight, I'm so pleased. But um, he was an odd man, very strange gentleman. Uh, during the war, Maxwell Knight, who was the head of MI5, was himself a ritual magician, and um, he knew Alistair Crowley very well. I discussed this type of thing with uh, Dennis Wheatley, whom I only met once and had a most marvelous evening with, many years after the war and um, he also felt that such a thing could exist, either as psychological attack per the media, which we saw on Profumo and Stephen Ward, and later on Jeremy Thorpe, which totally ruined their careers and caused Stephen Ward <coughs> to hang himself. No, to take an overdose, I beg your pardon. And I knew Stephen quite well, and he was very interested in the occult, as he called it. Um, the most frightening example of that was um, only about 10 years ago, I was asked in to help a lady who had been in special forces. She was a calligrapher. She did a lot of our forgery. We used a lot of special documents, ausweiss, this type of thing, that we would equip our agents in MI9 with and in SOE as well. And this lady had fallen foul of Coven, operating near Reading, so much so that a series of unexplained accidents had happened to her. And my wife and I went on a very bright April morning where we'd been for the rededication of the plaque on the north side of the chapel in Wilson Place, which has the names of 46 members of the Women's Motor Transport Corps who died due to enemy action. Actually, they contain the names of such marvelous women who I'd had the honor of knowing as Violette Sabo and Nur uh, Inyad Khan, who was one of the 
truly great operatives that we had with SOE. Um, the interesting fact was that this woman, who wasn't of nervous disposition and very tough, was totally terrified. The other interesting fact that my wife immediately picked up was that the atmosphere in her very charming Muse flat just off George Street was ice cold. I mean, much colder than the outside atmosphere. And although it was very brightly painted in white, the whole atmosphere was totally oppressive. When I asked her what she was doing about this psychic attack upon her, she opened a cupboard which she had lined with black paper and on it were dishes with floating compass needles in which kept turning and photographs of the people who were, as she believed, attacking her. Uh, I did what I could for her. I said, I'm not a specialist at this type of thing. I put her on to people like Dom Robert Petitpierre, who's a friend, and various mediums who helped her. Uh, she suffered still various types of attack. Uh, this was by now midday. And having convinced myself that in fact she was in some sort of trouble and was herself a practicing ritual magician, which she hadn't told me. She said she was a dowser. <coughs> we were driving back as I say, on a chilly, lovely, bright spring morning, and we got as far as um, going along the A3, just opposite uh, New Malden, and as I was talking to my wife, I fell asleep at the wheel. But luckily, in the last moment of consciousness, I pulled into the side of the road. Now, there was no question of a blackout, there was no question of a seizure, or laryngeal vertigo, the Visagrian maneuver in which you cough and cut your brain off from, uh, from oxygen. It was nothing like that. I was just talking, it went clunk, out. And she grabbed the wheel and we pulled into the side of the road. And it was about 30 seconds before I really came round. And that to me was an example of the sort of power that lies in, inherently in the type of, of field that we are investigating. As to its dangers, they're obvious. Uh, if you become obsessed with anything, doesn't really, there was a man who became obsessed with eating carrots and died. He was um, a civil servant who lived somewhere near New Malden. You can become obsessed with anything, but in this area, uh, in which you are literally relaying straight through to the unconscious mind, you have to be very careful how you proceed. And in the new book, which is coming out in the spring, I detail the whole of the, the, the uh, techniques by which my father uh, taught me visualization uh, without it becoming obsessive and then subsequently possessive. I've come across two appalling examples of possession, and I have worked with Dom Robert Pettipier, the late Dom Robert, who was one of the most exceptional men, like Eddie Partridge, when he died, that really was extraordinary, he was in hospital and he said to the nurse uh, quietly, excuse me, my dear, would you leave the room? I'm going to die now. <laughs> and she shot off to get the doctor and when she came back, he'd gone. <laughs> exactly as he said he would. Um, the worst example was Leighton Twig, a publican in Dover. He had become obsessed with finding out the winner of the... 130, the 230, the 330, etc. He was a publican. He didn't drink himself very much. He was very much a, a Clive Dunn character with rather snails type moustache and uh, very quiet and rather pedantic. And not at all the sort of person you would expect to be a, the usual archetype of the publican, full of bonhomie. No, no, not at all. But the pub was a place of pilgrimage because Leighton Twig could come up definitively with the winners of these races. In fact, he was investigated by the local police in case he was part of a betting ring. Unfortunately, he was one of those little men who have a very large ego and he became arrogant, puffed up, refused to take anybody's advice, including Eddie Partridge's and my father's, and eventually became possessed by one of the most terrifying <sighs> transmutations, that's the only word for it I've ever seen. This is a small man, about five foot six or seven, who became a man well over six foot, of great girth, his face swelled, it totally changed, 
lycanthropically into a totally different entity. The voice became a bellow. He stank of stale ale, and he smashed up every stick of furniture in the apartment above the pub. Eventually, it became so dreadful that his wife called in Eddie Partridge, my father, the uh, local doctor who was also a psychiatrist, or studied it anyway, and the local priest, and between all of them, including Charlie Walker, who was Eddie's uh, lifeboatman uh, brother-in-law, they managed to subdue this terrifying entity which had taken over Nathan Twigg's body. At the end of it, Twig broke down and returned to his normal size and thanked them. I mean, he was crying, he was, he was in a terrible state, and you know, the, the, the priest blessed him. He was put to bed for 48 hours, and everything proceeded normally after that with no trouble at all until people started saying, what's the matter, Leighton? You lost your powers then? What about the old winner of the 2.30, eh? And his vanity got the better of him, and this time nobody could get rid of the entity who was called Old Pal. And eventually Leighton Twig died in Charton uh, mental, mental Hospital in a padded cell. So people say to me, what is your spectrum of experience? That is a fraction of the things that my father introduced me to, that I was lucky enough to experience with my family, and which taught me the fractional amount of knowledge that I have at the moment. I cannot explain what forces were involved, because that is only a subjective theory as far as I'm concerned. I, I leave it to, to able and eminent scientists and engineers like Arthur Ellison, Eric Laithwaite, Dr. Richard Gregory, um, Professor John, John Hasted et al., and of course our friend from Edinburgh, Professor Wilson, and all of them I, I will listen to and hear their explanations. Bill Tiller in America at the Stanford Research Institute, Russell Targ and Harry Putov, and many scientists both here and in the Soviet Union, in France, in Spain, in South America that I have talked to. Obviously, there's a great awareness going on, thank God. Um, I don't wish to in any way offend anybody's religious susceptibility because that is an intensely personal thing. I try and keep an open mind. When people say, what is your religion? I say, I'm, I'm a, a Judeo-Christian. They say, what does that mean? I said, well, there's an old saying, roses are red and violence are bluish. If it wasn't for Jesus, we'd all be Jewish. <laughs> and I try very hard to study the old, the old knowledge which came out of Egypt. Um, I find the Kabbalah too intricate for me, uh, and I've had some very learned scholars ex explaining it to me. I'm fascinated by Professor Mandelbrot's uh, brilliant uh, synthesis, the, the Mathematics of Chaos, and with my nephew, who's a fine mathematician, and uh, a mathematical editor for Oxford University Press. He came down to explain to his idiot uncle how the math worked. It's non-linear, of course, and it's extraordinarily interesting how simple the equations are. Z can be substituted by Z squared plus C, the constant. If you plot that into um, a program for a high-capacity computer, as we've done, you receive images of incredible intricacy which go on up to the capacity of the, the computer. And we've actually used mainframe computers on it as well. And it's obvious that we are now beginning to crack some of the mysteries of this particular area. In it, as my father said, motive is everything. If you enter this area with the idea of acquiring power, you are going to be desperately hurt. I mean desperately hurt. Uh, if you enter it with the idea of using it in order to uh, manipulate others, also you'll be desperately hurt. If you enter it with an open mind, under advisement, and with the help of sensible folk like yourselves, you won't really come to much harm, provided you do it very carefully and never alone. Thank you very much indeed.